Professor Laurent Pech, you are uh, an academic involved in the Reconnect project, which is about looking at the relationship with democracy and the rule of law for citizens of Europe. Is there a direct link between the rule of law and democracy? Can you have one without the other? Uh, I, would, I would say there is a direct link. In fact, uh, the rule of law is quite often defined as a, as a bedrock on which you can build a democratic system of government. There is no democratic government without the rule of law. So the two go together, and I would add to this, and in fact, respect for human rights. So this is essentially the foundations of which the EU is built. But people will argue, certainly the Polish and Hungarian government, that they were elected. They have the, the will of the people behind them. Uh, as a lawyer, do you think you are interfering with the will of the people? Uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. I mean, this uh, will of the people argument is uh, being used very often to justify essentially crimes against the rule of law. This is not unusual. I mean, uh, we've been using will of the people since at least the French Revolution days. Um, so, uh, Anyway, uh, democracy is not the dictatorship of the majority. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be called a democracy. Uh, in uh, where in uh, Europe, at least uh, post-World War II, what we have learned is that democracy without the rule of law does lead to massive crimes. And this is why the two uh, go together. One cannot go without the other. And being elected for legislative elections is no mandate to violate the constitution, as in the case of Poland. In the case of Hungary, I would say that I have strong doubts regarding the fairness of at least the, the last two legislative elections and to what extent uh, the Hungarian government does represent the will of the people can be actually contested. The report on Hungary and the rule of law, the Judith Sargentini report, uh, one of the things that pointed out was the corruption. And one of the features of societies where you don't have the rule of law, you don't have an independent judiciary, is corruption. And yet... Um, we don't see a great deal of action. We've seen reports from OLAF, um, various infringement procedures, but we don't really, we haven't seen people go to jail. <laughs> As a lawyer, tell me, why isn't that happening? Uh, long story short, essentially, uh, the Commission does, uh, and OLAF in particular, they do investigate, they report uh, from time to time uh, in publicly that uh, they are working on some possible infringements of uh, EU law, possible corruption cases. But uh, it's difficult to believe, but at the end of the day, you're dependent upon national prosecution services to enforce uh, EU law, including national law, of course. So essentially, when you have prosecution services captured by the ruling party and the ruling party is itself uh, the guilty party in corruption cases, there is no guardian guarding the guardians. How can the EU intervene and, and change the situation? It has been suggested, in fact, I think that's the right course of action, that uh, we should suspend EU funding in situations where essentially the rule of law is uh, deficient, when there, is, when there are widespread violations or not compliance with basic elements of the rule of law, then we should suspend EU funding until these shortcomings are remedied. Now, the point, from the point of view of the Commission, um, we need a new regulation to do this. Uh, so essentially, until we adopt this new regulation, which the Commission proposed last May, what we might see is uh, widespread corruption uh, being left uh, essentially untouched, which is not acceptable. What can the EU do, which, which is in the, within its current powers, to stand up to those governments who show them such utter contempt? I guess Article 7 is a bit like Article 50. Uh, we never thought we would really need to have to use them. So and they're both proving uh, rather unworkable. In the case of Article 7, essentially, there is a reluctance uh, in the Council, which is the intergovernmental institution, to confront other governments. Uh, so what we are seeing is a, a dialogue after dialogue and no outcomes may say this is happening in Hungary that's their business it's happening in Poland it's their business why should somebody say in France or Austria care because we all EU taxpayers uh, uh, so being a French taxpayer uh, doesn't mean you should only care about uh, your taxes being well used and well spent in France if we have an EU budget then uh, everyone paying or contributing to the EU budget has an uh, interest in making sure that his taxes are properly spent anywhere in the EU.
where do you think the rule of law should rank in the list of the EU's concerns? I would say that should be number one concern. Why? Because once you start eroding the rule of law, then you start undermining the functioning of the EU internal market. And if you have no EU internal market, then why should there be an EU in the first place? So this is existential, I think, from the point of view of the EU. A, a member state leaving the EU certainly is a major issue, but it doesn't threaten the very functioning, the very existence of the EU itself.